let's get into this series here, the Bible. This series is starting today, five-part series, the Bible, all month long. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited about it. Um, we take advantage of seasons around here to, to talk about things that are pertinent, I believe. And so many people don't know that the, the Bible is categorized in, it has five different categories. There's five different categories of the Bible. There's history, poetry, and wisdom. There's the prophecy or, or the prophets, the gospels. And then there's, of course, the letters in the New Testament. There's five categories in the Bible. What we're going to do is week by week, we're going to dive into what I believe are the most important elements found in those categories of the Bible. And my hope and my goal is that you would be excited to go and explore these categories on your own. Go and explore these categories. So this series is summarized like this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture. Everyone say all scripture. All scripture. It's inspired. All scripture is inspired by God and useful. Say useful. useful. Man, it's not just like the, the churchy thing to do. It's useful to your life. At least it, it should be, should be useful to teach us what's true, make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us. You don't have to say that part. <laughs> it corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And my, my, my thesis, my one statement that I kind of want to summarize this series with is a growing relationship with God means a growing relationship with God's word. I hope you get that out of this series. I hope that you're excited to explore your relationship with God's word, God's spoken word. So today we're going to go over the first category. It's history, the history books of the Bible. I'll recite them to you later. I'm a little nervous about them. I'm going to recite them to you. I know what they are. I'm going to recite every single one to you. And next week, get excited for this is poetry and wisdom. And that's exciting to me because wisdom is big in our culture today. You know, you got Andrew Huberman, who knows all about the, the, the physical body. And then you got Dave Ramsey, who knows all about finances. You're like, well, what about Andrew Huberman? Well, what about all these podcasters? Well, what about Dave Ramsey? What I'm suggesting is any real wisdom they have originated right here. Any real wisdom worth having that stands the test of time goes right here. We're going to dive into that next week. So get excited for that. Get excited for that. But, but today, the history books of the Bible is, is if, if you don't know history, what are you? Doomed to repeat it. My father always told me those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. My dad wanted to be a history major but, uh, and teach history in, in college, but he ended up being an accountant because he wanted us to have you want us to have a, a, a house to live in. <laughs> I don't know if you could be a, a history teacher. There's like one and out of every whatever. But my dad was really into that. He shared that with me. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. I know he didn't coin that term, but he, he, he instilled it into me. The history of the Bible teaches us that people are terrible at following God's laws. That's what we learn from the history books of the Bible is that people... Excuse my language. They suck at it. They absolutely are terrible at following God's laws. Like just read those books of the Bible and just over and over and over again. They're just really, really bad at it. But you know what else the history books of the Bible teach us? God is good about forgiving us. Oh, his mercy is good. His grace is always like it keeps coming back for us. I love that. I love that. And about history, what, what you don't know can hurt you. Some people say what you, what you don't know can't hurt you. Well, um, <clears throat> yes, it can. What you don't know can hurt you. If you can't pronounce the ingredients, you probably shouldn't eat that thing. I'm just saying. I'm just letting you know. If you can't pronounce the ingredients, you should, probably shouldn't eat it. If you have to ask, you probably can't afford it, right? That's the one I'm really acquainted with right there. And then if you don't know what mom and dad are doing in there, you probably shouldn't come in without knocking because in that case, what you don't know could scar you for life. Come on, everybody. Locks save lives. Locks. I got an eight and a nine year old. Locks save lives. My wife left at a really good time. I was like going to look at her. She's like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> we did get warm in here. Okay. The same is true about the history of the Bible. If you, if you don't know it, you could be at a disadvantage in your faith. If you don't know the history of the Bible and the history books in the Bible, you could be at a real disadvantage in your faith. And the first up about the history books of the Bible is, number one, you can write this in your notes, the Bible's history makes it trustworthy. The Bible's history makes it trustworthy. I'm talking about how it was put together. 
its authors, the continuity, the timeline of it. Uh, a couple quick points. There was a thousand, there's a thousand prophecies, over a thousand prophecies found in the Bible, over 300 about Jesus, written over a 1500 year period, over three continents with 40 different authors. It's the most best selling book in the whole world, and it's the most stolen book in the whole world. Come on. Why? Like, what, what is going on? It's like the most random book ever put together. Uh, of course, out of all of these authors, all these continents, all these places, over 1,500 years, like, how, how does it all stay on track? But it does. But it does. And it's the best-selling and the most stolen. Why? Because Revelation 22 says this. Uh, John, on the island of Patmos, wrote these words. The angel said to me, these words are, say it with me, trustworthy and true. These words are trustworthy. They're true. The Bible's history makes it trustworthy. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophet, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Maybe the Bible never had its origin in human creativity, in someone putting it together. Maybe it's inspired because God already knew all there was to know, knew what was going to happen, and it got put together that way. Pinned by, pinned by man, but inspired by God. The Bible's history makes it trustworthy. So if you like that kind of stuff, if you like all those little factoids right there, stay tuned for week three. Week three is going to be jam-packed. If you like archaeological evidence, scientific evidence, stuff like that, if you're into that, week three, mark your calendars. That's the great festival weekend. So you got a choice to make, everybody. It's going to be good. You can do both, all right? Just, just, just go to both. It's going to be fine. You're going to be good. Number two is this. The Bible's history is authentic. Different than trustworthy. Trustworthy is one thing. Authentic is another. This one's kind of like strange to me, but like, let me put it to you another way. If I were making up the Bible, if, if I was responsible, hey, put together the Bible in such a way where people are going to read it and be interested, I'd make it a little more believable. I, I don't know. Like, have you ever read the Bible? Like, have you read it? Yeah. Start from the beginning. Go ahead. Give it a try. Start from the Bible. Yeah, there was a, and then the snake said to her, Wait, what? Wait, wait, hold up, hold up. Hold the snake. Yeah, and then, and then he went inside a whale. Yeah. Yeah, and then there was a flood. Yeah, everybody died except for like eight people. Yeah. Yeah. And then Jesus, he, he rose from the dead. It's like, make it more believable, man. Like, if, 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 the, if the Bible was made up, like, why would, you, why would you put all that weird stuff in there? But that's what I'm trying to say is that the Bible is authentic, in my eyes, it makes no perceivable effort to be believable. It just is true. Are you seeing that? Have you ever thought about that? Like, it's, it's authentic. It's just saying it the way it happened or the way that we need to read it. Whatever it is, it doesn't even try to fake it. If I wrote it, it'd be like, maybe the, the, the snake, like, slithered around in such a way that made the apple look good. You know, like at least try to make it believable, but the Bible doesn't do that. There's no perceivable evidence at all that there was any attempt to make the Bible believable. So the history books in the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and then Acts, okay? It's like it pause, and then it goes to the New Testament Acts. Those are the history books because they record history. And what those books show us is there is an authenticity there. There's just a, a realness. Is that a word? It's not a word. It's okay. There's a realness there. You know what I'm trying to say. It's just, it, it lays it right out for us. It lays it right out. All the way in all these books, I've got illustrations from all these. In Genesis, Adam and Eve sin right out of the gate. Why would, you, why would you put that there? Right out of the gate. They're just sin right there. People are terrible at following God's laws. Exodus, Moses, like the man. Moses is the man, the absolute man. Won't do what God says to do. Like 10 times he says no to God. And then he screws up so bad that he's not allowed to go into the promised land that he delivered the people out of Egypt. He couldn't even go into his own promised land. Have you read this? It's in those history books. We see how authentic it is. How about in Joshua? Joshua was Moses' predecessor, or excuse me, he was the one who came after, and then he took them through the Jordan River, and they started conquering the, the, the promised land. He conquered Jericho, and that very first one, God says, hey, Jericho is going to be like a tithe to me. Like you're going to give the first proceeds of this, this one city you conquer, and it was miraculous. They marched around it. The walls came a-tumbling down. 
You heard that one? And it was a, a miracle. And this guy named Achan is like, nah, I'm going to keep some gold because, you know, God probably won't see me. <laughs> what? What? Like, did you, you were there. He was there. Achan was there. He saw it all happen. But it, like, it just, the Bible tells us what really happened. It's amazing to me. Um, how about Judges? <laughs> the epicenter of failure in the Bible. <laughs> If you need a good laugh about how terrible people are at following God's laws, it's just one generation after another that the, the people left God. They stopped worshiping him and then they came back and then they were sad and cried about it and then God forgave them and then they stopped following again. Ju the epicenter of failure. Judges, hilarious. Kings and Chronicles. Okay, the best king that Israel has, like their main guy, King David, the second king of Israel. There was Saul, he was bad. And then there was David. He was good. The best. He was the best king. The be their best guy. You want to know what he did? He's he, one of his mighty warriors named Uriah. He's listed in the Bible as one of the mighty warriors of David. There's only like 30 of them. Uriah is one of them. David knocks up his wife, Uriah's wife, and then is like, oh, I'm busted. Then kills his own That's their best king? Bible, please, like, do me a favor here. I'm trying to preach this thing and get people to believe it. They're not going to believe this. But the Bible's so true that it's so authentic. It just tells the truth to us. My point is clear. The Bible doesn't take any parts out of history that are unflattering. That's how you know the Bible can be trusted. And, and the, the Bible being so authentic like that is just wonderful. Let me tell you a story about how I tell stories. I want to tell you a story about how I tell stories. I like to put things in the best light for myself. Don't look at me like that. You do the same exact thing. So I've told the story around here several times. Maybe you've heard it if you haven't. It's the story of when, when Tiff and I were first married, we had an oil change issue. Okay, there was a budgetary issue where I needed to wait a couple of days where we got paid to get an oil change. And I, <clears throat> being the man of the house, let her know that I'm going to get this oil change when I feel like it. But the way I tell the story is, you know, I go get the oil change and then I feel bad about it. I'm walking home and I'm psyching myself up for my love for her. And the story ends with me being the good guy. But what I don't tell people usually is I got mad at her again the next day. <gasps> like that's, uh, don't look at me like that. You do the same thing. You come to me and you complain about your marriages. You complain about your lives and you always make yourself seem like the good guy. You ain't. Don't lie to me. I've read the Bible, I know. Like I, cause I, me and Jesus, we're, mm, I know, I know. Like, <laughs> pastor, but she just won't, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna stop you right there. I'm gonna stop you right there. Okay, the Bible's authentic. That's why we can lean on it. Number three, third thing about the history of the Bible, and this is the biggest thing we need to talk about today. The history books of the Bible. The big idea of the Bible's history is God's covenant with us. This is the, this is the huge focal point of the Old Testament of, well, really the whole Bible, in my opinion, the whole Bible. But it, it appears and is articulated and illustrated in such a way in the history books of the Bible that God's covenant with us is made clear. It's made clear. It started with Adam and Eve, honestly, where God made some promises to them and, and made a covenant with, with mankind. But then with Abraham, who was known as Abram, at first, Abram, and then God came into covenant with him and changed his name to Abraham, which Yahweh has like this thing to it. And so God inserted his name into Abram's name and he changed his name. Just like in a, in a wedding or a marriage, you change your name, you take on each other's name and you have the same name. God did that with Abraham. That was my best Hebrew, Abraham. Maybe I will take that water. No, I'm playing. I'm just playing. And then with Jesus. And Jesus comes and solidifies this in the New Testament. says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But what the history books of the Bible teach us is that God, this, is what, this was his plan from the beginning. That God wanted to come into covenant with mankind, with you and me. He says, there's an agreement here. And, and I'm going to do some things. And then I'm going to invite you to do some things. And then we're, you're going to be my people. And I'm going to be your God. It's beautiful, really. It's beautiful. The best passage that describes this covenant, both old and new, is in Deuteronomy, I believe, chapter 30. It's a longer chunk, so just bear with me. Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 19. Today I have given you the choice. Notice that, that, that word is very, 
very important. I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness. It's like witnesses, right? There's witnesses, like in a wedding, there's witnesses. There's, you have to have witnesses there or else it didn't happen. And you have the two sides. I call on heaven, bride side, and earth, groom side. I call on heaven and earth as witnesses to the choice you make, to the vows, you, us, me, all of us, to, to the choice you make. That's covenant talk, all of that. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants, it's not even just us, it's our descendants, it's our family tree, it's our, our heritage that we inherit, and then it's what we leave on as a legacy, that your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. Notice this language. This is the key to your life. <laughs> Love that. Key to your life. And if you, and choose to, I'm inserting that, if you love and obey the Lord your God, if you choose to do that, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. And there he is, Abraham. It's, it, it got, this covenant got officiated through Abraham. It became really official at that point. And that's where, of course, the people, the Jews came from. And then we know as Gentiles, most of us here as Gentiles, we're grafted into that. Okay, I don't have time to, to teach through all of that, but our point is clear. God came into covenant with man, but it's a choice that we make. It's a choice that we make all throughout history and the history of the Bible. God teaches us the choice between life and death is ours to make. It's ours to make. We make the choice. We make the choice. We've all made wrong choices and you've probably made some good choices in your life. But all throughout history, God continues to give us the choice. Are you going to choose me? Covenant is two-sided, a lot like a marriage. I just did a wedding yesterday, actually, on this stage, in, in this room. We had a wedding in the house yesterday. There was, there was bride side. There was groom side. There was witnesses. There was vows that were made. Their names changed. Like, it all happened. I was, I was witness to I officiated it. I officiated it. Both made sacrifices. Both said, I'm leaving my, my family that I am with, my father and mother. I leave my father and mother to become one with my wife, right? All of this is happening. But the difference between God and uh, earthly marriage and God is he's perfect. Ladies, the search is over. Your perfect husband is Jesus. Come on, somebody. It's good. You're like, look at it. You're like, I'm like, yes, I got some clappers in here. Yes, absolutely. The search is over. He's your perfect husband. And, and let me just tell you this, this real truth about marriage, men and women. We put God and Jesus first. Your marriage will be better because he's your perfect husband. He's your perfect, he's not a wife, but you understand he's the perfect mate. He, like when we go first with him, everything else works out. And it's not just true in your marriage. It's true in your whole life. But when we put him first, everything else works out. Everything else works out. He gives us the choice between life and death. And so I want to try to illustrate this, this choice between life and death. And I've got two, I got two foods here, two of my favorite foods. Some of you already know what this is. I, I set before you the choice between life and death. And some of you are saying this crumble is life. Okay. First of all, crumble is life. But let me talk to you about this really quick. It's like so stuck with sugar. It's like it won't even come off the bottom. I could tip it up all the way. It's a harder choice than you think life and death. You know, you think about it like, oh, life and death. Cool. I'll just choose life. We're good. Right? Like if, if you read that in passing and go, oh, I'll just choose life. We're good. Everything's all, all set. It's easy. That's an easy choice to make. Is it though? Is it though? When you're living your life and, and you're presented with choice after choice, thousands of choices that you have to make every single day, each one of them have a tendency to represent either life or death. And uh, the appeal of these two choices is a lot like this. A lot like this. Now, technically, both of these foods can sustain you for a while, but I did some quick math. All 12 of these eggs has less calories than this one. Oh, do you want to see it? I want to see it. Just smell it. Hallelujah. Just smell it. I just want to smell the choice of death. I mean, I'm not going to eat it. 
this one, this one choice right here has about 1,100 calories in it, this one. It cost $5 for this one. So you could eat this one thing, or you could eat this whole carton of eggs right here. Has less calories. The math is uh, 840. All of these eggs, 840. It's like 200 less calories. This has like no nutritional value for you. None. This has like life in a shell, like everything you need. It's got vitamins, nutrients, protein, healthy fat. Like I, I lost all my, like I gained a bunch of weight and lost it all by eating mostly eggs. I just don't judge me. I just, that's what I did. This is, is, will sustain you. It's good for you. But how easy is this choice? It's not. So don't tell me it is because it's not. The choice between life and death is not easy. It's not easy. Both can sustain you for a little while, but one, if you just make this choice over and over again, is going to eventually weaken you and will drastically shorten your lifespan. One will make you incredibly strong. I wanted to wear like a different shirt today, but no, it's fine. It's fine. You know, I didn't want to make anybody stumble or anything like that, so... And I'm actually going to eat these later, so I'm putting it back into this, like, little cold bag right here because you think I'm playing. I'm, these are my eggs right here, okay? I'm in my eggs. But it's funny how the choice between life and death, one is so much more appealing than the other. This is true in life, that the choice between life and death is not as straightforward as we think. And when we read the history books of the Bible, we're so quick to say, oh, look how dumb they are. Look how dumb. Look how dumb these people are. Why would they do that? Because it's not always easy, everybody. We need to learn from history. We need to learn from history that people, we, us, let's just talk about us. We struggle with this. We need, we need to lean into these choices that we're making every single day. It's the choice between do I, do I date her? Which, which job do I choose? Do I work that overtime? Or do I choose to spend more time with my family? Uh, it's the choice between do I watch this show on Netflix, or do I watch that show on Netflix? Little choices, subtle choices. They add up over time, and it's the choice between a delicious blueberry, gooey, yummy, I just, I need to stop talking about it, or eggs. Y'all, there is no, there is no marketing here, okay? There is no, like, who, who decided to make the box, like, even the box looks like Come on, do something, paint it. I don't know, do something. There is no effort there. And sometimes the choice between life and death can be like that. The, the, the healthy choice, the choice of life is so ho-hum, so boring looking, but it leads to life and strength. So how do we choose life? How do we do it? How do we do this? We learn from history and we don't want to make the same mistakes they, they made. So how do we choose life? Number one is this, admit to your propensity to sin. That means your tendency or your, your urging towards. First of all, admit you like crumble cookie. Admit it. <laughs> or ice cream or, or that show on Netflix. You have a propensity to, you have a, we have propensity towards what causes death. It's called a sin nature. And uh, it's been said that pride comes before the fall. That if we think, oh man, I'm above it. Yeah, I can, I can date them. I'll fix them. I'll fix them. They're, they're probably, I'll, you know what? I'm going to bring them to church with me. Problem solved. It's been said, pride comes before the fall, but humility leads to honor. And that's every category of the Bible. Watch this, Proverbs 16, 8. This is Old Testament. Pride goes before destruction, haughtiness before the fall. Matthew 23, but this is Jesus speaking in the gospels. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will choose life more readily, will be exalted. The choice to life will be more, made more easy. And then Romans 3, this is in the New Testament now. For everyone has sinned. Everyone falls short of God's glorious standard. The first step for us is to admit, I need him. I need his help. I need God's strength. I need his power. Because I will always, we're always going to be susceptible to the drift. All of us, every single one. And the minute you take your eye off the ball, the minute you think, well, no, I, I got this. I don't need to do that. 
well, I don't need to do the, that, that, you know, generosity thing. Or, oh, no, I don't need to do, you know, church every week. Or I don't need to, like, just fill in the blank. The drift is real, and it hits us all. I have to deal with it maybe differently than you, but we all deal with it. The drift, the drift. The people of God, watch this. They had the promised land at one point. They had it. They built a temple there. They had it all, and then they lost it all because they drifted from God. They lost everything, and God said, all right, I'm going to conquer you. I'm going I'm to let people in. Your walls are going to get breached, and you're going to get taken away uh, to Babylon. You're going to be taken by them. And then guess what happens? They turn back to God. And God in his infinite mercy is like, all right, I'm going to let you come back. They eventually got it all back. They rebuilt the temple, moved back into Jerusalem. How did they get it back? They confessed their sin. Watch this. I've got it for you in the history books. Nehemiah, on October 31st, the people assembled again. And this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. This was a symbol of humility. This is a symbol and a sign of them lowering themselves and being humbled. They used to do that. They would wear stuff that says, I'm in mourning. And what were they mourning? Their own stupidity. Their own drift. They were mourning their own drift that they had walked away from God. Those of Israelites' descent uh, separated themselves from the foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They didn't even stop with themselves. And my son, oh yeah, and my, my grandpa, he used to do that too. Lord, I'm sorry for what he did. Like they, they were apologizing for their own ancestors. It's just right here. It's right here. They remained standing in place for three hours, all right? I tried to preach a sermon in like 40 minutes. They were confessing their sin for three hours, that's a long time. And the book of the law of the Lord was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours, they confessed their sin. This is crazy to me. And they worshiped the Lord. Six hours a long time. Like, that's a lot of sins. Everybody, six hours? Come on. They don't, confessional's not open that long. That's like the whole thing. That's the whole thing. For six hours, that's what they did. It's like when you're a parent and you bust your kid. You know, they got chocolate all over their face, all over their hands. And, and you're like, did you eat the cookie? And they're like, chocolate all No. Mm-mm. Chocolate all over the shirt, white shirt, chocolate on. No, I didn't. Honey, you have chocolate on your face. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is there anything else? I ate the popsicles too. Ah! Is there anything else? Yeah, my sister ate some too. And he starts snitching on other people. You're confessing sins for other people. You're confessing everybody's sin. It's kind of like that. That's the moment they were in. They were just like, they were like, woe is me. I am undone. And everybody and every sin I ever saw somebody else commit, I'm going to confess all that too. Because they're, and what I'm saying is maybe, maybe, you know, a, a good session of confession would be good for us. Not right here, not right now. We're not going to have a three hour confession situation, but have you ever felt like you're not living in the land that God promised you? Like, you know, God promised some things to you and he showed you some things about your life, some things you could have done. And you're just not living in the land. Maybe that session of confession is exactly what's going to bring you back to the land, let you rebuild that temple. Like I'm, I'm trying to bridge the gap here. They rebuilt the temple. Second temple in Jerusalem was because they confessed their sin. Maybe there's something to that. Try it. Just confess. Confess to God and confess to a human being, a safe one. You know, not just anybody, but a safe one. Confess to God, confess to a trusted friend. It could unlock some major breakthroughs in your life. It did for the people of Israel. It did according to the the books of history that we're supposed to be learning from. It brought them right back into the promised land where they belonged. If that seems hard, consider this. Number two, let God's grace turn you towards him. Let God's grace turn you towards him. So it's not all bad news today. It's not all bad. In fact, the most powerful tool in turning people's hearts back to God is the fact that he's so forgiving He's so loving, he's so graceful, he's so merciful, he continues to forgive us over and over again. And it's God's grace that, watch this, it's in Romans 2, 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Like, come back to him. He's kind, he's tolerant, he's merciful, he's forgiving. Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's not to guilt you out. It's to make you say, all right, God, I'm a, I can come back to you today. I can come back to you in this season. I was drifting from you. I was drifting hard. But you know what? I'm coming back. 
I'm coming back to God. I'm coming back to church. I'm coming back to the place where I belong. And I hope, you, I hope that you see that in, in history, people couldn't always keep up with God's perfect standard. And that's true today. Oh my gosh. It's more true today than ever, I'd say. The temptations are rampant. It's so hard to live a godly lifestyle these days. But God's grace leads us back to him. God's always faithful when we cry out to him. Today, I'm asking you to choose to see how good he's been to you. I know there's been hard times in your life. I know that. I know there has been. But there's also been some good times where he's helped you out of a bind. Remember that? Remember that time where God helped you? Where he was there for you? Don't forget about that so quickly. It's a choice to see it, and it's also a habit to continue seeing it. This is, a, this is a pro tip for you. I'm encouraging you. Keep a gratitude journal. This might seem terribly touchy-feely to some of you. But I like to consider myself a manly man. I've been keeping a journal since 2016. Let me tell you, I've seen some dark times since that long ago. And I've seen some good times. And my own diary app pops up with reminders, and I don't always like them. Because I record the good stuff and the bad stuff. You know what it does? The good stuff reminds me, oh yeah, God was faithful to me. God helped me in that situation. He really, he really showed up for me. And then when the bad times show up, you know what it does for me? God really brought me through that season. I'm still standing I'm still here. Wow, my marriage is, is, is good. My kids are good. And when I look at all those hard times, I've been through some dark times. 2020, 2019, it was, it was touch and go, everybody. It was touch and go for us as pastors, as leaders. We had relationship fallout. And, you know, it was just, it was hard. I'm telling you that because I know it wasn't just me. You've been through it too. If you start making this a practice in your life, keep a gratitude journal and just, just log the things that you've been through. It'll remind you of the good times and the bad where God has brought you through those times. There's something to writing things down so that you have it for later. You're forced to articulate it. It helps you remember. It helps you share it with others. Consider this. It was written for us. The good and the bad was written for us. Do you think it's beneficial? Not only for them, but now for us, thousands of years later, thousands of years later, oh my gosh, like just even talking about that time of my life was really hard, but it's, it's helped me. It's helped me to, that reminds me that God's grace brings me back to him. God's kindness, his goodness brings me back to him. At the end of it all, last thing I'm asking from you is this, this last point, choose life today. So the choice has been presented to us, choose life today. Every single word of that statement I, I picked carefully. Choose. So it's your choice. Life, which is found in Christ alone. Life is found in Christ alone. Today means don't wait till tomorrow. This is not something I want you to do tomorrow. It's something I want you to do today. Choose life today by obeying God. Every good thing comes from him and is waiting on the other side of obedience to his word. And your breakthrough in life is waiting on the other side. If you would just dive into him fully, completely with your whole heart, choose life today. Choose life today, truly and fully. Choose today to put your hope and your trust in God and his word fully, wholeheartedly. Go all in. Why wait? Why not? Why would you, why would we not do this? How? 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 i got a couple ways that you can. First of all, how? Pray the prayer with me. At the end of the service today, I pray a prayer every single weekend. Every single weekend. And it's a prayer of, of committing and recommitting. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you've done, how many times you've done it. We all experience the drift, and sometimes we gotta, we got to choose to get back. You never drift into a good relationship with God. We drift out of good relationship with God. It's a choice to go back in. It's dedication to go back. Pray that prayer with me at the end of the service today and mean it. I mean it. Be, pray it authentically. 
Pray authentically. It's not just repeat after me. No, it's, it's you saying, I'm giving my life to you. I'm coming back to you. How can we do this? How can we choose life today? Get into a group. This is not just a thing we do. This is life to you. It's life. Salvation comes from God, but healing comes from God's people. Confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. One to another so that you may be healed. Choose life today by choosing community in God's house. Choose it. The, the groups are in the back. Please, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, do this for your own sake. It's not for, I don't, I don't need it. I got my own group. I'm good. We're good. I want it for you. How? How, how can we choose life today? Do the growth track with us. I mean, you love God, but you haven't really, like, you still are kind of like, uh, I'm not sure yet. And you're, you're hesitating on the commitment level. Then it's, it's an open door for everyone to come to the growth track after second service and, and become family. Like it's open, it's, it's for you. Just be family with us. This is God's house. These are God's people. It's really hard to have a great relationship with God and a distant relationship with God's people. It's not the way God set it up in his word. That's not the way God set it up at all. So I'm inviting you. This is, a, this is a serious thing we do. And it's a fun thing we do. Do the growth track. You love God. This is your first step, the on-ramp to everything in the life of the church. And remember the Lord said this, Deuteronomy, you can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, that's salvation, and obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. It's life groups and growth track. It's right there. It's right there obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. And then notice what it says. It's the key to your life. It's the key to life. Choose life. You know, I was, this is not something I just preached to others. This, I experienced this. I, I got saved in the Salvation Army in the rehab over there in Stockton back in 2007. And for two years, I didn't go to church anywhere. I didn't know I needed to. So, I had that going for me. But I'm, I'm t looking back, hindsight, it was a rocky road. Not being committed in the house of God. Not having this. Not having the family. Not having a place to serve and discover my gifts and use my gifts to reach others and bless others. Not having this. Looking at, as soon as I came to this church, this is my first church I ever came to. This one. As soon as I got here, instant. It was an instant transformation in my own personal life, I fell in love with God's people. And in that way, I fell in love with God in a new way. Because I was going to heaven when I died. Like I got saved in that, in that program. No doubt about it, I was going to heaven. But my life was incomplete here on earth until I came here. I'm not saying this is the only church ever, I'm just saying we, we belong together. You and me, we belong together. It's a family. It's the way God designed us. It's the way he made us. That's right. That's true. I can tell you with full confidence, full conviction, and from experience, and from the word of God, there's, no, there's nothing else left. My life has never been better than when I truly and fully committed myself to God in his house. That's my prayer for you, that you would love him and commit to him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. Father, thank you so much for every single person here who's ready to choose life today who's ready to choose life today. I, I pray that our hearts and minds will be open to receive everything you have for us. And God, I just ask that anybody kind of standing on the fence, Lord, push them over. Push them over. Push us over into your side so that we can be safe in you. And Lord, give the encouragement that we need to make this choice to choose life today and to go all in with you. Some of us are coming back to you. and Some of us are coming to you for the first time. But no matter who you are, if that's you, if I described you in any way, heads down, eyes closed, would you please lift your hand up and say, that's me. I'm ready to choose life today. Amen. Yes. Is there anyone else? Yes. Anyone else? Come on. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I see you. Yes. I see you. 
Is there anyone else that wants to choose life? Recommit or commit? This is your opportunity. This is your chance. All right, everybody, let's pray. Let's pray together. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I'm choosing life today. I'm coming home to you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. And show me the path that I should take. In Jesus' name, amen. 